Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Peter Horobin. Uh, the question that I've pondered a lot is, why isn't everyone healed? Or how come some people that seem to have all the faith in the world love God with what appears to me all their heart? They die. They die saying, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus died for my diseases. But they still die. Uh, why is it I go to a meeting of a great healing evangelist and I see rows of people in wheelchairs and a couple of people, a miracle happens, they stand up, but then I watch hundreds leave in the same chairs that they came in. Uh, yes, I have a lot of questions and I'm sure you have a lot of questions and that's why I've made it my passion to understand healing. Well, my guest, Peter Horbin, has some answers, answers that are different than what many are speaking. He's saying that the sickness is purely the symptom, not the cause. And until you get to the cause, you will not get the results that you're looking for. Now, Peter, how in the world did you come to this conclusion? Where did it really start? It began for me personally with a, a vision that God gave me for healing, which was 30 years or so ago. And uh, 20 years ago, the Lord led at the beginning of a ministry, which is called LL Ministries, and we have many people who come on healing retreats. And I'm a scientist by training. And as a scientist, I, I ask questions. As a chemist, you learn to analyze things. And I began to understand it's not ungodly to ask questions about people's lives and not just to pray for them to be healed, when you realize that there may be issues in their lives which actually they're not facing. So we've been talking already about forgiveness. And if someone is bitter in their heart, but they want healing, but the sickness they have is a consequence of that bitterness, there's no point in praying for healing. What we need to be doing is to teaching so that people can understand the issues and deal with them. Uh, you and I were talking last night, mm. and we were talking about both of us are involved in what is known as the charismatic yeah. movement, but there is a fallacy involved. Explain that. Well, sometimes there's a fallacy because... Many pe times. <laughs> people, they, they look for an experience and they look for God to do something a bit like a sort of magic pancake landing on them. And when you actually look in the Word of God and you look at where sickness comes from, you find a different situation. You don't find the magic pancake formula. What you find is actually godly order. In Psalm 19, it talks about the revival in our heart comes from looking at the laws and the statutes of God and living our lives in accordance with them. And in Deuteronomy, it talks about in the blessings that come through obeying the covenant but then it talks about in 28 verses 15 and onwards, all the sicknesses and things that come into our lives when we step outside of God's covenant promises. We disobey his commands. For example, there's a high cliff near one of our centers and there's a big sign there which says, do not proceed beyond this point, danger. And you might say, well, I'm under grace now. I'm not under law. No, no one's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to keep on going. Right. <laughs> and I can absolutely guarantee, no matter how much grace you're under, if you step off the edge of the cliff, you will discover the law of gravity the hard way. Grace is not going to prevent you discovering the law of gravity. And there are spiritual laws which are just as potent and just as real as the physical laws of the universe that we live in. Because we don't just live in a physical universe, we live in a spiritual universe. And God's covenant was expressed in commandments, not so that God could stop us doing things that we might enjoy doing, but so that he could prevent us going beyond the parameters of safety so that we would actually be able to enjoy him and enjoy our lives. So within the commandments, it says, don't have any other God before me. And if we do, what happens? The spiritual powers of those gods, which are the God of this world and all his agents, they start to control our lives do not commit adultery, what happens? If we join uh, ourselves? Uh, uh, let me ask yeah. you a question, uh, because in one of your teaching I was listening to, you talked about a man that had, had multiple sexual partners. Yeah, that's right. And what happened 
what was actually happening to him? And tell me that story. Okay. Uh, well, he, he had come for healing on, on one of our courses. And then he began to hear the teaching and began to understand that he had been many, many times involved in relationships with other women, over 50 of them, it turned out, in the end. Now, what happens when you have sex with another person? Is, is you excuse me. Them, yeah? We have a whole generation now that I've, I, I've talked to some of these young mm. kids, and they, they, I mean, they have sex just like we used to play uh, uh, play a game or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, 50 is, is, it's is unusual. really, no. It's unusual. And, but what happened to this man? Okay, so he realized that the word of God says that actually adultery is sin. And adultery in scripture means fornication, it's sex before marriage or sex outside of marriage or all sorts of bizarre perversions, it's all adultery. And when you actually have sex with the person, you become joined together with them, because that's what God intended marriage to be. They become one flesh. So that a husband and wife, they are not just physically joined through intercourse, but they actually become joined in spirit and soul. They become one with each other. Is that why people that have been married for a long time begin to act, think, Absolutely. talk the way each other and does? And even look like each yes. other. Yes, Because there's a it's growing amazing. together. You can, you can recognize a couple that have been married a long time mm. because there's something of the one that's in the other and something of the other in the one. Mm. And that's what God intended. And that's a reflection of our relationship with Jesus as the bridegroom and the church, the bride, that we grow to be like him. The longer we know him, the more we reflect who he is. And so the marriage relationship is a covenant relationship where God intended us to grow like each other just in the way he likes us to grow like him in our relationship with him. Now, if a person has sex with somebody else, it's not just a physical act which is over. They are actually joined together as if they're married. So this man, he'd been married 50 times because he was joined together with 50 other women. And when he repented of the sin and I prayed this way, I said, Lord, I ask you, because this is something only God can do, I ask you to break the ungodly soul ties where they've been joined together in spirit and soul as well as body. The bodies had come apart, but the spirit and souls were still joined. Lord, I ask you to break those ties and to take away from this man everything of those other women and to bring back to this man everything of himself that he's given away in these relationships. You know, at the end of that time of prayer, he made an extraordinary statement. Uh, I hadn't primed him, he hadn't heard any teaching which would give him these words. He said, I felt myself coming back together. Hmm. He said, I feel as though I know who I am for the first time that I can remember. Now, simple explanation of that, actually he didn't know who he was because he was 50 other people. All had an influence in his life. Uh, I, Peter, uh, th th this is pretty deep, but the Bible does talk about the dangers of sexual sin. And in mm. our society, we talk about pregnancy, AIDS, but there's something far more horrible. We'll continue this discussion. Be right back after this word. Hello, YouTube, Mishpucha. Mishpucha is a Hebrew word, it means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe, then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Peter Horobin, and we're talking not about symptoms. What are symptoms? Cancer back pain, paralysis, deafness, sicknesses of all kinds. Those are symptoms. We're talking about causes. It's about time that we went after the causes rather than the symptoms. Now, we recognize the cause comes through a devil, a broken nature, uh, sin. But specifically, Peter, uh, we were talking in the first segment about people with sexual sins. Uh, I want you to give me another example. I'll tell you about Karen. Karen was, was 18 years of age. She came to one of our healing services and she stood at the front of the meeting hall and, and she said, I'm 18, I've got 12 months left to live. The doctors have said they've got a viral condition on both kidneys. They've done everything they can for it. There's nothing more they can do. And she said, my church has prayed, I've prayed. It doesn't seem as though God's answering my prayer, there's no hope. 
Now, when someone speaks like that, your heart's full of compassion. And uh, it, it's bad when you lose, oh, lose hope. You, you lose hope. When you're 18, you've, mm. you've had nothing of life virtually. And uh, I just cried out to God, and God, what do I pray? And God spoke right into my spirit something that I was totally uh, surprised by. He said, ask her about her mother. And I almost had an argument with God. I said, look, it's her kidneys that are the problem, not her mother. And uh, I said, Karen, tell me about your mother. And she said, I can't tell you anything about my mother. I said, why not? She said, well, when my mother was 16, she got pregnant. And I was born, and I was given away for adoption on the day that I was born. And I had done nothing about my mother or my father. And immediately the Lord gave me a revelation. And I said to her, well, in that case, you're the product of sexual sin. And she laughed. She said, I've never thought about it back hmm. that way. But uh, she said, yes, that's true. I said, have you ever thought that you need to forgive your parents for their sexual sin? Because you know what the scripture says, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. It's like a curse, which makes us vulnerable mm -hmm. to all sorts of things. Oh, up to four generations, up which four. means her children could have be affected. Yeah. So she said, no, I've never forgiven them. And I said, have you thanked God for your life, that you were not aborted? She said, no. I said, would you do those two things? She said, yes. And she thanked God for her life. And then she forgave her parents for their sexual sin. And then I prayed and I asked God to cut her free from every curse that had come upon her at her conception because of that sexual sin. Now she was joined to her mother here at the navel and she immediately felt something happening there. It was as if something snapped on the inside mm. and she felt something unwinding and it was coming up through her chest and then she began to gag and she was delivered of a spirit of infirmity. And immediately she wasn't healed, but she had been delivered. And she said, I said, how do you feel? She said, I feel light in the inside. I feel something's gone. I said, okay, well now let's pray for your kidneys. And I had with me that night another member of our team who was also an 18 year old girl. And I said, would you actually pray now for Karen by laying your hands upon the kidneys? The kidneys were very swollen. They were in a lot of pain. She couldn't bend over. And I said to the other girl, you lay your hands on that and pray. She said, what do I pray? I said, do you pray in tongues? She said, yes. I said, well, you just pray in tongues and ask God to answer the prayers that he gives you. And she prayed there for 20 minutes. That's a pretty sharp way to pray because you're praying from the Holy Spirit, touching your spirit, mm -hmm. perfect prayers. That's a great way to pray. Yeah, it's a brilliant way to pray. I came back 20 minutes later after I prayed with somebody else. And I said to Karen, how are you doing? And the swelling had gone from her kidneys. The pain had gone. She bent over and she touched her toes, something she couldn't do before. She was radically and totally healed. See, she had to deal with the issue of forgiveness of her parents, the consequences of their sexual sin, thanking God for her life. They're all issues which lay in the way of her healing. But once they'd gone, she was free to be healed and the Spirit of God healed her. I got a letter from her six weeks later. Uh, she'd been back to the hospital. The hospital had rerun all the tests. They said, there's no evidence of any virus left whatsoever. Go and live a normal life and forget what we said to you last time. Question. Yeah. This is the word I've been thinking about mm -hmm. this whole segment, different than what we've been talking about. Fear. Mm -hmm. Can fear open up a door with symptoms of various sicknesses? It, it can indeed. Uh, f fear is, is an issue which controls many people's lives. The, so, something that happens in their life and they become totally traumatized on the inside. And a particular incident can become a source of fear for the future. You know, I, I had one lady who had to come to America uh, on business. And uh, the day before she had to fly, she'd never flown before. And she said, I can't go, I can't go, I can't go. I, I, I'm afraid of flying. And she came for prayer and I prayed for her, I prayed for deliverance and nothing would shift it. And she went home and uh, I was really upset. I said, God, why haven't you set her free? And she was upset. And as I prayed, the Lord put a word right into my spirit and said, she's not afraid of flying at all. So I picked up the phone and telephoned her and I said, you're not afraid of flying? She said, of course I am, that's why I came for prayer. I said, no, you're not. What you're afraid of is crashing. You're not afraid of flying at all? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and as I prayed for her over the phone about the fear of crashing, she was delivered of her spirit and she went on the America the following day, no problems. She, she had seen the terrible trauma of the air crash in Tenerife where two planes collided on the runway. I think it was five, six hundred people were killed. And she's seen the pictures and the fear had gone right into her spirit. You know, I believe in this country there are many people who are in fear and traumatized because of seeing the continuous rerun of the 9-11 disaster. They saw mm. it 
and they're traumatized on the inside and Jesus needs to set them free. I'll tell you what, we'll be right back because I believe that many of you, as we pray for you, are going to be set free. But I want to talk about another issue, rejection. I'm Jewish. And if there's ever been a people group that have experienced rejection, it's my people. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Peter Horobin. Fear, it's insidious. Many people are physically sick and the cause is fear. Peter and I were talking about seeing the pictures over and over again about 9-11 and so many of us have picked up spirits of fear as a result of that and fear of what might happen in the future. Can you pray a supernatural prayer for those people and many of them where fear is the cause, yeah. I believe, are going to get healed? A lot of people who are vulnerable for fear are vulnerable because they actually do not have security in God through the love of Jesus. And scripture says that perfect love casts out fear. And so the key to being delivered and set free from fear is to actually know the perfect love of Jesus. And if you're struggling with fear right now, I would ask you simply to say, Jesus, I love you and I want your love in my heart and I'm going to ask you to set me free. So whatever it is that's the root of your fear, whether it was 9-11 or some experience you've had, I want you to bring that experience to God right now. It may have been abuse, it might have been an accident, a car accident, a car crash, falling off a horse, a whole range of things that might have happened in your life that's put you into fear and you now live your life to try and avoid those circumstances. I want you to simply just bring that circumstance to Jesus and say, Jesus, I love you. I know that your love overcomes all the powers of darkness. And as I pray for you now, I'm going to ask that God is going to set you free from fear and heal you of anything that's come into your life as a result. So Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you will extend your healing love right into the hearts of those people who are watching right now. I take authority over the powers of darkness that have caused fear to bring sickness and disease. And I tell that sickness and disease to go now in Jesus' name. And I ask, Lord, that you will anoint them with your Holy Spirit, bringing restoration of spirit, of soul, and of body, that your people, Lord, may be set free to live without fear so that they can fulfill their destiny in Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter, I believe that many people have been healed at mm -hmm. this moment, but I'm concerned about many people that are experiencing rejection. Yeah. Uh, rejection because uh, you're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, rejection because, and, and look at this plastic surgery business. Everyone is changing their, uh, their appearance to look like whatever is, is yeah. perfect. Most people don't realize how accepted they are. I, I have a Jewish mm -hmm. believer in Jesus friend by the name of Jeffrey Steinberg. And uh, he was uh, born, unfortunately, without arms and legs. Mm. And he calls himself God's masterpiece. If he can call himself God's masterpiece, how about you? Mm. Would you talk about rejection? Sure. Many people, at the moment they're born, they feel rejected. They're, they're born a boy and parents wanted a girl, so mm. immediately they're, they're the wrong sex. And what does that do on the inside? Some people are not even wanted when they're conceived. And the first thing that a, a mother says when she discovers she's pregnant, oh God, oh no, she's mm. not crying out to God for help. She's actually almost swearing and saying, this is the last thing I wanted. How does the child feel on the inside? And there are many circumstances through life where people experience something which is a total rejection. A, a father, who, who they a are. mother. Yeah, well, might one of the people them. I prayed for a few years ago, he was a doctor in his early 50s and he was uh, pensioned out of the medical profession, he was depressed, he was suicidal and uh, as I began to talk to him about his, his medical profession, he said, I hated it. I didn't want to be a doctor. I said, well, why did you become one? He said, my father wanted to be a doctor and because he didn't have the right background to be able to get the training, he made a vow and said that if I have a son, he will become the doctor that I couldn't be. Hmm. And so he said, I wanted to be an engineer, and I was always making models and things like that. And the person I am, he said, was totally rejected by my father, and he forced me into medical training. He said, now in mid-50s, he said, my life's over, because 
I, I, I don't love myself, I hate myself, I've re been rejected of everything that, that, that I am as a person. I'm forced into something that God did not plan me to be. He experienced tremendous healing because he was able to forgive his father at that moment. And as he forgave his father and came to an understanding of what was going on in his father's own broken heart, God then began to lift that depression off him. And as that depression lifted on, off him, he began to actually see hope again, even in mid, late, mid, late midlife, to see hope again. Another man who was similarly depressed, uh, at the age of seven, he had one child, one toy, a precious toy that was his own. All his other toys were hand-me-downs from his older brothers, but this was his. And as he was playing with it on the carpet at home, one of his big brothers came in and stamped on it. He was heartbroken, pouring tears out. And his father comes in and says, no child of mine's gonna be a crybaby. And he picked up this little boy, put him across his knee, and he thrashed him mm. for crying. You know, that little boy, was total rejection. At the time he needed love and comfort and encouragement from his father, what he got was punishment. He hated his father. He'd been rejected deep in his heart, and, and rejection turns to hatred. And if we nurture rejection, hatred will take root and that bitterness will produce a harvest and in this man's case again it was deep depression medication for 25 30 years he's no longer on medication because he actually was able to go through forgiveness and that, let that issue be brought to the cross and be healed how long did it take that particular ministry didn't take very long it was a couple of hours it, but it, it, see, I mean, how many years on medication oh 25, 30 years. And only God knows what the medication yeah, does to right. the body. Yeah, there's a lot of side effects of that. But it, it was a couple of hours. But it wasn't just a case of an instant just pray over someone and see them healed. It was a question of what's the issue? And he'd forgotten all about this incident with the toy. And I said, okay, now, that, now those are your symptoms. We're going to ask God to show what the cause was. Because I'm not going to pray for the symptoms because I want to actually deal with the root. I can pray with the symptoms. You could actually feel a bit better, but next week you'll still feel the same problem. And I prayed and I said, Father God, I ask that your Holy Spirit will come upon my brother and you will show him where the root of this was. And we waited five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. And he suddenly began to talk and he said, I can see myself playing on the carpet with my favorite toy. <gasps> and he froze and then began to cry. And all that pain of all the years came out. See, a couple of hours and he's healed. But it, it's sometimes important to get to the root so that we can actually deal with the real problem. 30 seconds, look in the camera and tell people that God made them the way they are yeah. to be satisfied. God not only made you as you are, he loves you. He loves the person that you are. He loves the gifts that he gave you. And he wants you to be restored so that all that you are can be fulfilled. So that all the stuff that the enemy has put in over the years can be stripped away. And you can become once again the person that God intended you to be. I've prayed for hundreds, thousands of people in this way healing so that they can fulfill their destiny. I pray that that will be your experience as God takes away all the mess of the years and restores you so that you actually are able to accept yourself, love the person who you are, and see God make you the person he wants you to be. May the Lord richly bless you. I tell you, there is such a presence of God, it's because of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. He is the reason that you are accepted in God. Get to know him well.